Uh, so yeah, uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the dial and seasonal variation in calling behavior uh, of a Ottawa population of boreal chorus frog or western chorus frog. They're still deciding that one. One of the main things that people uh, who are looking into conservation and management and monitoring of uh, frog species is calling behavior. And the reason for this is because calling behavior is associated with reproduction. So what are the main things that we want to know about calling behavior is what are the factors environmental, temporal, as well as uh, human causes on this calling behavior and how does it change over time and throughout the breeding season? Uh, one of the more traditional methods oh, is to kind of go out into the field listen to which frogs are calling, uh, make a note of what time of the day, what time of the year. But more and more people are using uh, autonomous recording units or ARUs because you are circumventing potentially the bias of you being physically in the field affecting how these amphibians are calling, as well as being able to arguably collect more information in a more efficient manner. So the species of interest for myself is the uh, the chorus frog, boreal slash western chorus frog, and specifically the population, let's see if this works, that's right here, that's just kind of disconnected from the rest, which is in the uh, uh, Ontario and uh, Quebec population, and they've been significantly declining for the last 60 years. In fact, in some portions of the range in Quebec, they're only in 10% of their historic range. Uh, so I'm jumping right into how I did things. So uh, my acoustic monitoring schedule was to sample from the end of March to the middle of May. I did this at three locations, both in 2022 and 2023. And for each lo uh, location, for every hour, I recorded a five minute clip with these audio moths, which is this uh, fun little device up here about the size of a playing card. and. Um, yeah, like I said, for five minutes every hour at the top of the hour. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, in 2023, uh, this location here at the bottom, Harris Hill, I wasn't able to get. So I got uh, two locations in 2023 and three locations in 2022. Uh, even with that bit of loss of data, I still had 5,364 audio files, which is over 460 hours of data that I went through. So. What did I do? Uh, I used the North American Amphibian Program's Monitoring Calling Index, which ranges from zero to three, zero being no animals calling, one being a few individuals calling with little to no overlap, two being some overlapping calls, but you're still able to tell, oh, one individual's here, another individual's there, and then three being a full chorus of wall of sound, not able to identify individuals. So uh, and the bottom here is just shows a, a depiction of the acoustic sound. The individual kind of long lines are individual boreal chorus frog calls, not the little dots. That's another species. So the first one here on the left is a uh, level one, and the one on the right would be, uh, did I get that right? Maybe not. <laughs> we'd be a level three. <laughs> so just jumping into some of the kind of preliminary raw data, if we first look at the top on the uh, right there, you can see that uh, on the bottom of the x-axis is the day of the year, and then on the y-axis is the mean calling index. So for this, I took an average uh, for each of those days across the three locations in the two years. And as you can see, they start calling uh, around day 92, which uh, is just the very beginning of May, or sorry, April. Uh, there's a peak, and then they drop off a little bit, and then they have like smaller peaks and then stop calling around day uh, 130, 135, which is like May 10th, May 15th. And that's very similar to the Desola et al. data that was collected in uh, Ontario, um, which it shows that calling kind of begins around day 90, 100, and then drops around day 130, 140, 150, depending on the latitude. Um, similarly, uh, on the bottom on the right, you'll see hour of the day, uh, and once again, the mean calling index for each of those hours. And so 
basically what you can see there is that there's a, a lull in the early morning around 6, 7 a.m., which rapidly picks up in the later morning, early afternoon, and then is fairly constant in across the evening and night, and then dropping once again in the early morning, which is very similar to the Brindley Buckley et al. data for this species, uh, where you see the, pretty much the same pattern. So this is great, but looking at individual um, kind of factors that affect calling behavior is not very informative. So I wanted to make a model where I could put several of these factors together and make some more predictions about calling behavior in my area. So I made a logistic regression model. Uh, first, I converted that uh, four level index down into a binary calling absent, calling present. And then uh, with my predictors being uh, time of day, which I blocked into uh, four levels, morning, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., afternoon, um, noon to 5 p.m., evening, 6 to uh, 11, and then night, midnight to 5 a.m., uh, day of the year, which is a uh, continuous from about uh, day 87 to day 130, the interaction between those terms, um, as well as whether it was raining or not raining, and then a unique site year code for each of the locations. So there'll be five unique ones for the three locations that I sampled in 2022 and the two locations in 2023. So uh, the hypothesis was that the kind of more environmental climatic weather variables would be strong predictors of uh, acoustic behavior, whether or not they're calling while the, the site year one would not because the locations were fairly close together uh, between six and nine kilometers. So I didn't expect any like huge variation that you uh, they've seen in other studies where they go across uh, more of extreme ranges of latitude and altitude. But uh, contrary to what I thought, everything was significant. Yay. <laughs> so let's go into it. Um, so the first one, this is a graph just showing the interaction between time of day and day of the year. Uh, bottom axis would be day of the year. Then we have the predicted probability of hearing chorus frogs calling on the Y. And then um, the individual lines are the time of day, morning being red, blue being afternoon, green being evening, and orange being night. So what we see is that the beginning of the season the highest probability of hearing them calling is in the afternoon, and that steadily decreases as the season progresses, where all the other time blocks, we have an increase in the probability of hearing them call. And what is most likely happening here is early in the season, they want to uh, take advantage of the warmest part of the day, uh, increases their metabolism, being able to call more uh, vigorously. But as the season progresses, it becomes too hot for them. So they're actively avoiding that period in order to not reach their thermal maximum. Oh, and I forgot to say that these are these values are adjusted since it's in a logistic regression model for it being at Limerick Forest in 2023 when there is no rain. Uh, second, this is what I didn't really expect to happen, but uh, Hare's Hill was the place to be uh, if you're a boreal chorus frog with about a 62, 63% chance of uh, you hearing them in the morning on day 111, which is April 21st, and no raining. Uh, and then least likely to find them at the Limerick Forest location, and then intermediary at uh, the County Road 15 in both years. So that was a bit of a surprise, and I have to think a little bit more about maybe why that is potentially associated with habitat. And finally, I saw about a 10% increase in the likelihood of um, chorus frogs being observed or heard um, when it was raining. So that's fairly consistent across the year. So if it's raining, there's just a bit of a bump that you'll hear them uh, calling. Uh, the finally, uh, just one thing that I haven't inter incorporated into the model yet, which I know does affect their calling behavior, is forms of disturbance. And of course, these can be human related, such as people physically being there. Several times, if you kind of go close to where they're calling, they will stop calling. They're not like uh, they're, 
They're friends that spring peepers, which will call no matter what, doesn't matter what you do, you can pick them up and they'll still call. These guys are a little more shy and uh, will stop calling if you go near them. Um, but it can also be other things like cars going by, planes going by, trains, they'll affect their behavior. There's also environmental ones. So if it's an extreme weather event or like heavy rain or, or, or high winds, they will stop calling if it's uh, violent enough, I guess is the word. <laughs> and then finally, the one that's most interesting is the interspecific competition uh, between species. Uh, going back to the Dusola et al. 2004 data, uh, I don't know what I did. Oh, there we go. Um, you can see that as chorus frogs stop to call, um, other species begin to call. And so that could be to avoid getting their calls overlapping. It could be other forms of competition between the species, but obviously there's some form of uh, behavioral modification based on what the activity of other species are doing. So in their study, the American toad and mink frog were the big species. For me, it is the spring peeper, the gray tree frog, and the wood frog. So hopefully incorporating those, I can make even stronger predictions about when and where we all hear chorus frogs. And that's it. Thank you so much. And I uh, welcome any questions. Uh, I'll repeat my question. How did you analyze your, your recordings? Did you do it by ear or did you use software? Uh, I used it by ear, but also uh, if I if I can go rapidly back, um, there it is. Oh, I used a, a a program called Audacity where you can visualize sound. So this helped me kind of pick up even if I couldn't hear, is the species still calling? I could. They're very stereotypic uh, visualization of how those species look in this program. And the spectrogram is what they're called. Hello, um, I am, so you mentioned that um, when the temperature gets high, the activity will be a bit low because it might reach their thermal um, maximum or something. I'm curious about what uh, whether you have observed whether there's a minimum uh, temperature they will call. So this year, um, I think I've, uh, there's a period of cold in April and the activity seems to be uh, low in Ontario. So I wonder whether you might observe, um, you know, whether there's a minimum temperature or um, yeah, for, for the calling activity. So the question was just about, is there a minimum temperature for their calling behavior? Uh, all the literature will say around three, four degrees Celsius, but some of the locations I observed, it was below freezing and they were calling not very vigorously and like kind of a modified call, like very slow and creaky, uh, but Usually, they want a temperature that's at least four degrees, and then they'll call normally. All right. Are, are you seeing any interactions with the trilling calls of the peepers? Um, so is there interaction between the peepers and the uh, chorus frogs? Um, I did observe some trills of the spring peepers, but the, the two instances, so very um, anecdotal, is that they were two peepers right next to each other. And usually that trill call is a territorial rather than an advertisement call. So I didn't really have a big enough sample to really know if there is interaction. Yeah, there's sometimes the peepers trill at the beginning of the season. Yeah. And and I mean, I learned about this in Massachusetts where there's no chorus frogs, where there was, there was a swamp that was just trilling uh, first thing in the season. Um, that's the one benefit of using a program like this where you visualize it. They're, the trills do look different between mm -hmm. a chorus frog and a spring peeper, and you are able to tell the difference. I, I can speak to the trilling and peepers as well. Go ahead. Peepers will do that really early in the season, but I'll also do it on cold days. I, f I feel like it might have something to do with they're actually like warming up. Uh, so there's mm -hmm. there's the territorial element, but there's also the like kind of like the way that like dragonflies will vibrate. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to share with you all a little part of the research I'm doing for my master's dubbed Intra and Interspecific Hibernation Site Selection of Three Sympatric Species. As I was saying, I'm doing this research under the supervision of Dr. Carl Larson and Dr. Lee Ann Isaac out of Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia. I also want to give a special shout out to my peer, Lily Ragsdale. Together, we share the same study population. So stick around for her presentation just following mine to learn more about these interesting creatures. 
So when I say selection, I am in particular talking about habitat selection. And across our big, beautiful world, we have so many diverse expressions of it. Everything from a black bear choosing like the coziest den in the winter to a hermit crab meticulously weighing a shell to find its next home. Or even an eagle finding an ideal perch to build its nest and raise its young. Just like that, our snakes, especially here in Canada, have to find adequate winter refugia to circumvent cooling weather and sub or inclement weather and sub-zero temperatures. These are also known as dens or hibernacula. And on the outside, they may not appear to be more than a hole in the ground, a pile of rocks, or a crack in the rock face. You know, it's what's on the inside that counts. And internally, these features have the structural, the thermal, and the humidity conditions to ensure the survival of these snakes. Now, a really interesting phenomenon that pairs with denning here in Canada, or especially as you go higher up in latitudes, is this increased occurrence of communal denning, where these seemingly solitary creatures congregate together to overwinter. And although widely observed, it's not widely understood, as the question of why communal denning occurs is still largely unanswered. There are a lot of different theories in the literature. Feel free to pick my brain about them afterwards. I want to point out one that we call the den scarcity hypothesis. This belief that maybe there just aren't enough dens. And so all these snakes have to congregate to what is available. Now, if that is the case, and there is this limitation in dens, then understanding the habitat selection becomes that much more important, especially if we can put some sort of legal protection on it, such as the case for my study species, the Western yellow belly bracer, the Great Basin gopher snake, and the Western rattlesnake. These three species are listed as threatened provincially in British Columbia and federally here in Canada, and they garner legal protection on their dens on Crown conservation land, such as my study site, Lac du Bois Grasslands Protected Area, just north of Kamloops, British Columbia. This protection, though, is virtually meaningless if we don't understand the habitat we're protecting, which was basically the case when three of these dens were recently disturbed by active pipeline construction on my study site. Now, this disturbance elicited a response through Thompson Rivers University by Dr. Carl Larson and the BC government by Dr. Lee Ann Isaac to create the research project I have the honor of being a part of. I get to look at the overwintering dynamics of these snakes, in part by looking at habitat selection and communal overwintering. And in the second part, I'm not talking about today, assessing an artificial den that was created. Billy Ragsdale presenting just after me is looking at how the active season behavior of these snakes were impacted by this disturbance. So stick around for hers to follow. Today, the objectives are twofold. I wanna learn more about communal denning, in particular, seeing if any habitat features relate to the abundance of snakes. It is generally known that animals congregate what at habitat that is selected more strongly. So I predict there will sort, sort of be this variation between dens that are more heavily congregated at versus not. In the second part, I just wanna understand more about these species, especially the little known ones, to understand what they're selecting for and the variation between them. I predict some behavioral differences between these species will in part explain some variation. And of course, to do this, I have to have some methodological approaches. So first step is finding the dens to study. Luckily, there were already seven on my landscape that were known. We found an additional 15 in conjunction with Lily Ragsdale's radio telemetry. And then six we found opportunistically just surveying the site. So this gives us 28 to work with of varying compositions of those three species. Once we were at dens, we did these active den surveys to get a count of snakes. Unfortunately, my study site does not have robust enough data to get population estimates at each of these sites. So I settled with comparing the number that I found emerging from our 2023 egress season. And I ensured that surveys were equal between the sites. Of course, I have to collect habitat features. I found 14 habitat features to collect based on relevant literature or similar studies done here in Canada on snake dens. And these were taken at a micro scale, one meter radius around the den mouth and or a macro scale, 10 meter radius. These were collected at each of those 28 known dens as well as a paired random site. The paired random site is a random direction and a random distance between 30 to 400 meters away from the den. And that brings us to our analysis. I want to preface that I'm using models. So before I bog you down with what that entails, I just want to say that I did a lot of pre-analysis to ensure the variables going into the models were limited as my sample size is small. Um, and so doing that, I use something called the univariate analysis. And I also did correlation testing to ensure there wasn't anything funky going on with correlated variables going into my models. 
So in terms of abundance, I use something called a Poisson regression. Poisson regressions are great for um, non-negative data, so like such as count of animals. And in doing so, I put in the selected habitat features and I regress them against the number of snakes at dens. I did this individually for species, gopher snake, racer, rattlesnake, at the micro and macro scale. And to determine their habitat selection, I used a logistic regression. It's commonly used in resource selection studies. It's called a resource selection function also, where I compared known den habitat to random sites. And again, I did this for each species individually at the micro and macro scale. So in terms of results, I'm not gonna bog you down with all the values, but I use something called an Akaki information criterion and every all the results I'm presenting are from the top models that were selected. So in terms of abundance, what we saw is that more snakes were generally associated with more stable habitat features. And I'll get into what that means in a second, but more gopher snakes were generally associated with less shrub cover, more racers with less rock cover, and more rattlesnakes with less dirt cover. When I look at these features individually and I compare them to the known types of den on my landscape, they most coincide with something called a rocky outcrop den. These generally have not a lot of vegetation, not a lot of dirt cover, but a lot of rock cover. They're also persistent on the landscape and not as vulnerable to environmental conditions as say a rodent burrow den. Um, rodent burrow dens are sort of the antithesis of this. They have a lot of vegetation, they have a lot of dirt and not a lot of rock cover. And they are extremely vulnerable and don't persist as long term as rocky outcrops. In fact, the one we're looking at now has since been destroyed by the great snake cows. And so in theory, having a more persistent or long-term den would be more conducive to communal denning to allow for the uh, accumulation of snakes. In terms of habitat selection, we found that all three species were selecting for dens on increased slopes. When we average all the slides together, they were found at about 56 plus or minus 23 degrees, which looks about like that. We conclude this is probably the optimization of stability, access, and solar exposure. As slope increases, stability decreases as landslides and rockfall becomes more apparent. As well, the climbs become near vertical, so it's a little bit less accessible for snakes. However, as slope increases, solar exposure increases, which creates more ideal basking habitat for snakes. And so theoretically, these mid-range slopes are sort of that ideal range for these snakes to be found in. In fact, another study done in Washington state found that western rattlesnakes down south also select four dens on slopes of around 56 plus or minus 12 degrees. We also sat, found that snakes selected for increased cover in the form of larger den mouths and smaller distances to the nearest cover rock. Spring in particular is a really vulnerable time for snakes. They're really cold coming out of the den and they're putting themselves into some risky positions by basking more. And so having a large mouth to retreat to or cover objects around the den would obviously be conducive to their survival and reduce the risk of predation. Finally, we found variation between the species where gopher snakes and racers were selecting for more cover features. It is known that these species are generally found away from the den mouth during emergence. Um, we often found them under cover and gopher snakes are known to thermoregulate under cover. And so selecting for more cover for gopher snakes in the form of more mouth, more shrub cover, and for racers in the form of more rock cover would be conducive to their behaviors. And for rattlesnakes, we found that they selected for increased basking features in the form of less vegetation around their mouth. Rattlesnakes in particular are a really overt basker. They hang out right at the den mouth in large groups. They're just soaking up that sunshine. So having less vegetation to um, block the sun would be more conducive to their behaviors. But overall, what we found so far is that there are some characteristics that do at least relate to the abundance of snakes at dens. And although it does not answer why snakes communally den, perhaps it provides sort of an additional mechanism to look into, that being sort of this habitat selection piece that could totally relate to the availability of dens. And I think future research, it would be really cool to look at the landscape to see how available these features truly are. We also saw that we can differentiate known dens from random sites on the landscape which could help stewards, you know, in order to protect these sites a bit more. Do I think that people are going to be able to pinpoint dens with these features? Absolutely not. But perhaps it's a first step to understanding general areas and the behavioral context of these species when trying to identify sites to protect. Finally, it offers a cautionary tale. At least for Western rattlesnakes, they're a very well-known species in British Columbia, and we have over 370 dens identified in the province of British Columbia. 
We often assume that gopher snakes and racers are present in those dens as well, which is probably true. They do share dens a lot, but it would be unfortunate to exclusively assume that those are the dens that gopher snakes and racers are using, especially when we can see that they have behavioral variation. And so perhaps they're using other sites as well. And with that, I thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Hi there. Thank you. Such a good presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm from Flatland, Ontario, so I don't know <laughs> how, uh, like, in the environment, how common are slopes that are more um, steep than what you were finding in the hibernacula? Like, I don't really have a context for how steep that is in your environment. Yeah, that's fair. I guess context specific, my random sites were actually a lot, uh, like, um, less steep. And so I, for me on my site, maybe that's on the steeper end. However, in the study done in Washington state, their random sites were actually on the opposite end at about 76 degrees. And so I assume that this is mostly like a mid-range slope for these species, at least in the broader context when I'm comparing to uh, external literature. But yeah, in terms of my site, although it is BC, it's a bit more mountainous, I was seeing that random sites were actually less steep and that they were at about 24 degrees while my dense sites were at about 56 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, hey. great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you happen to notice either like in the data or just anecdotally, yeah. if there were interactions in like the makeup of which species were in there, like if uh, if there were like a large amount of one species, would you usually find less of another? Or oh, how that interesting. Impact? Yeah, I, I, I would have to say it's anecdotal. We definitely don't have a lot of sites and I wish we had more, but a lot of our big communal sites are made up of like a lot of rattlesnakes. And when we find gopher snakes and racers, there is generally to a much like smaller degree. Some of our other sites that I find the most interesting are sites that are exclusive communal or ex exclusively communal to gopher snakes and racers um, and don't have rattlesnakes present. But I can't say like if one is more present, if it's like impacting the other others presence perhaps it has to do with their own sociality I feel like that's a really cool step in understanding these snakes a bit more um but yeah I I can't say with the data I know but there are certain dens that are exclusive like communal racer and gopher snakes and I think those are the most interesting dens on my landscape <laughs> first of all would you mind just going back one slide I'd love to snap a photo of your conclusions oh thank you <laughs> thank you um, also, okay, this might be a silly question, but I was just wondering how you incidentally encounter a hibernaculum. Yeah, no, I mean, we have been surveying the site for three years now. And so in the general areas of where other hibernaculums are, there's often other sort of pockets you find, whether it's a completely different species emerging or whether it's the same. And so we differentiated sites about a 10 meter difference, a 10 meter distance between mouths as being separate sites especially on certain habitat where it's just like it's probably not even in the same chamber because they're so far apart or it's completely different species using that uh, mouth, for example. So when we were just surveying known dens, we started coming across sort of other opportunistic ones. But the help of radio telemetry was by far the best way of identifying sites. And that's sort of another conclusion I didn't bring up here today that for people to be conserving sites, I think radio telemetry is definitely the way I don't think you're opportunistically going to find a lot of sites. So, yeah. to survive longer and colder winters than experienced elsewhere in their range. Kathleen White uh, published a really great thesis in 2008 on gopher snake movement behavior in the Okanagan, which is a region of British Columbia. She found that gopher snakes left their winter den dens beginning in late March. They mated in May, throughout May, with males actively seeking females. Oviposition occurred in late June and early July, and snakes began returning to winter dens in September going on until October. By the end of October, any snakes that were going to make it through the winter had found some kind of winter refuge, and they stay there until the following spring. So my research took place in Lac du Bois, which is a large protected grassland in the uh, Nicola, or, uh, Thompson Nicola region of British Columbia. My study site was this area 
My study site was this area here around the Bachelor Bike Trails. Due to the study site's proximity to the city of Kamloops, which you can see just south, uh, and its accessibility, there were quite a few roads and bike trails that transected my study site. It was heavily frequented by hikers, mountain bikers, and dogs. Here are a few more pictures of the study site. So my project really began in the fall of 2020 when the Trans Mountain Pipeline began construction of a right-of-way which cut through the front of Lac du Bois. As they were constructing, you can see the right-of-way here is the sort of linear road-like disturbance. Uh, when, they began, when they were constructing uh, and excavating this right-of-way, they came across three snake dens. Uh, the dens were subsequently excavated and effectively destroyed. Over 50 Great Basin gopher snakes were removed from these three dens. They were artificially overwintered, and they were translocated the following spring to a single artificial den that was created to offset the loss of those three natural dens. So here you can see the remnants of one of those dens along the right of way, and where this black cloth is, is around where that artificial den was constructed. This is a figurative map of my study site. So in red are the disturbed natural dens along the right of way, and in yellow is the single artificial den. As you can see, one of the disturbed natural dens is quite a bit closer to the artificial den than the other two. Unfortunately, when we inherited the snakes in the spring, we had no information on which snakes came from which dens, which disturbed dens. I'm gonna, for my research, I decided to play it safe and I'm just gonna be looking at the shortest possible translocation distance, which is around 50 meters. It's possible that some of the snakes that I tracked came from the dens that were farther away, but I have no way of knowing. So we sought to determine if a 50 meter translocation had any effect on snake movement behavior and survival over two years. Uh, we hypothesized that if translocation affected snake survival, then translocated snakes would have lower survival rates than reference snakes and or have less than 50% yearly survival. And that if translocation affected snake movement, then translocated snakes would move more than reference snakes. And I'll get into why we came up with those hypotheses in a second. We looked at five movement parameters, mean distance traveled per day, mean distance traveled per movement, movement rate, sinuosity, which is essentially path straightness, and recursiveness, which is the rate of uh, return to the same site. Uh, a sample population of the translocated snakes, along with reference conspecific snakes that we uh, located from natural surrounding dens, were tracked using radio telemetry. Snakes were tracked from May to October in 2021 and 2022. We made locations every one to three days when possible. And at each location, we recorded UTM coordinates. So I'll get into uh, a little bit of research on um, there are a few there are a few signs that a translocation has failed based on previous work on snake translocations. They are declining body condition over time, high movement rates, high movement rate in, in snakes uh, increase the likelihood of mortality from predation and along roads. Uh, low survival in snakes, the bar is set at. Uh, less than 50% survival per year, which is not very high, and dispersal from the drop-off location. So for my research, we decided to focus on movement behavior and survival as measures of whether this translocation was successful. So over, uh, we, over the total number of telemetry snakes that we tracked over two years grouped together, so we didn't track uh, 44 per year, but of those 44 telemetry snakes that we tracked over two years, nine died. So that means that quite a bit more than 50% of snakes survived each year and over the two year period. Of those mortalities, uh, one third died along roads from collisions, one third died from predation, and one third died from unknown causes that we determined were not road and we don't think are predation. We found that uh, survival was not, look, uh, not related to translocation in 2021 and 2022. During the entire 2021 active season from May to October, we found that males traveled more per day, more per movement, and had straighter paths than females independent of translocation. 
In 2022, we found that there was no difference between any group. It's worth noting that in 2022, we tracked a lot more males than females. We tracked the snakes that we were able to find in spring. And that year, we happened to find a lot more males. But this really low uh, sample size of females may be why we don't see these same sex-specific differences in movement that we saw in 2021. So I split all of the movement data up in the 2021 active season. I split it up by activity period, and I found that in spring, male snakes traveled more per day, more per movement, and had faster movement rates than females, independent, again, of translocation. In summer and in fall, there was no difference between any group. So in May, sna male snakes were traveling more than female snakes, and they were traveling at faster rates. This finding uh, supports previous work on gopher snakes that has found that female or male gopher snakes travel more than females during the spring during their mating period. That's because the males are actively seeking out female mates during this period. The fact that we found this clear uh, difference in movement behavior between the two sexes really, I think, bolsters our other finding that translocated snake movement behavior was indistinguishable from reference snakes. Had we found no difference between any group as we did in 2022, then a stronger argument could be made that perhaps our sample size wasn't big enough to see any differences. But we do see in our data, we do see this clear difference between the sexes and male translocated snakes appear to be moving similarly to male reference snakes and female translocated snakes appear to be moving similarly to female reference snakes. In summer of 2021, we found no difference between any group when gravid females were grouped with non-gravid females. In 2021, we had three gravid females in our telemetry population. Two were reference females that laid their eggs in early July, and one was a translocated female that died in early June and was not included in the summer movement analysis. When these two reference females were analyzed, two gravid reference females were analyzed separately from the non-gravid females, we found that the gravid females moved more per day than males and non-gravid females. This result is again supported by previous work on gopher snakes that found that females will travel, gravid females will travel long distances to reach suitable oviposition sites. Something that was kind of interesting about our study population is that the rate, our rate of gravid females both years, in 2022, we had no gravid females, uh, was pretty low compared to other studies on gopher snakes, particularly White's 2008 thesis. In her thesis, she found that most of the females that she tracked, all but one each summer, were gravid, and some females were gravid back-to-back -back summers. In our study population, we kind of found the opposite. Most of the females that we tracked were not gravid either summer, and no snakes were gravid back-to-back -back summers. There are a few things that I think may have contributed to the low rates of gravid females that we observed in our population. The first is that 2021 was the year of the BC heat dome, which saw higher than average temperatures uh, that coincided with the reproductive uh, egg-laying period of gopher snakes. The second is that, as I mentioned before, our study fight site was heavily trafficked by people and cars. There were a lot of roads. It's possible that these roads were acting as linear, linear barriers, making it more difficult for males to reach female mates and for females to reach oviposition sites. It's worth noting that that one female that died in June was hit by a car before she could lay her eggs. So to summarize uh, the findings of my research, we found that males traveled more, per, more than females over the entire active season and particularly in the spring. Gravid females traveled more than males and non-gravid females in summer. And the rate of gravid females in our population was lower than in other studies. And finally, we found that the movement behavior and survival of translocated snakes was indistinguishable from reference snakes. So essentially, based on the uh, parameters that we looked at, it appears that this translocation was successful. Yay. Um, <laughs> there are two things that I think may have contributed to the success of this translocation. The first is that it was a very short distance translocation. 50 meters is really not much in the grand scheme of things, especially considering that some of our snakes traveled around 50 meters on average per day throughout the active season. 
And the second is that uh, the snakes were held at the den mouth for a few days before release. So it was a soft release that was timed with the uh, egress uh, at surrounding natural dens. A recent systematic review uh, of snake translocations found that soft release was positively correlated with a successful translocation outcome. So in our case, it seems like these two things were done right, and that led to overall a positive outcome of this translocation. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Please contact me. Hi. Uh, fascinating presentation. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, just as a background, uh, how common is it for gopher snakes to move among um, hibernation sites? And so I'm curious if a translocation isn't as stressful if they perhaps move back and forth between different different spots? That's a really great question. Um, there's site, or fidelity to hibernation sites is more a question for my colleague, Veronica. She's been looking at, at hibernation site fidelity. But I would say that a concern is more dispersal. So if this is a very short distance translocation. So the concern of dispersal from the drop-off location, which dispersal means more movement, which means more risk of predation and road mortality. So in our study, that wasn't really a concern. But if you were to translocate a gopher snake two kilometers, there might be a greater chance that, that snake, even if it could find an overwinter in another den, would have an instinct to disperse. Not necessarily to go back to the exact same den that it came from, but uh, there, yeah, it would be probably more disoriented than, but that's a really good point. It, they probably don't, we, we've found that they don't always return to the same den every year. Did you include uh, the old winter experience in the survival assessment and the snakes return to that artificial hibernacula? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the second part, again, would be that's Veronica's work, and she's going to publish that pretty soon. Um, but for uh, survival and whether what, what period we were looking at for survival, we looked at the full two years. So one of the mortalities that you saw here was a snake that we found dead uh, during egress the following spring. Seems like that was one of the, the unknown deaths. We think it came out too early and died from exposure. Hello, everyone. I'm Claudia. I'm a I recently defended my master's at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Niall Rawlinson and Christina Davey. Um, and I'm super excited to be talking to you guys about turtle emergence and the social and ecological drivers of that emergence. And so in the animal kingdom, acoustic communication and social behaviors widespread. It's used in birds, mammals, insects, amphibians, and even fish. And now the way acoustic si or signals work is they are produced from an emitter and they um, go to a receiver and that receiver has a signal response. And that signal response can uh, function in behaviors like mate choice, cooperation, territory defense, or parental care. And so that's on the signaling side, but then on the, the ecological side, um, a lot of ecological cues mediate life history transitions. Um, and so this uh, life history transition can be very important for species uh, survival. And the issue with ecological cues is that um, it, it can be difficult to adapt to changing environmental conditions. And so one idea is that having socially cued life history transitions can help with the flexibility of adapting to variable environmental changes and adapting your life history transition to those variable environmental conditions. Now, switching over to non-avian reptiles, we know they're social. I don't have to tell a room full of herpetologists that reptiles are social. Uh, they have behaviors like courtship, hatching, and parental care, and a lot of their acoustic communication facilitates these behaviors. And so of most recent interest is acoustic signals uh, in turtles or one of the interests. And there's a recent paper that was published on the diversity of these signals. And so there are over 50 uh, adult turtle species that are known to vo vocalize. And even though we have this evidence, there is a lack of empirical evidence um, that looks at hypotheses for the evolution of these signals. Um, 
And so a large question in my research is trying to understand why um, turtles vocalize and how that might be related to their social behavior. And so in a turtle's early life stage, synchronizing their life cycle events can be really, uh, syn synchronizing that life cycle events um, can be fun with ecological and social factors can be fundamental to their early life survival. And so the turtles need to escape the nest, dig out of the nest, and find an over a suitable overwintering spot um, or stay in their nest uh, so that they can survive uh, the winter and some and avoid predation. And so my research uh, is focused, my thesis aims to understand how social and ecological factors collectively influence uh, cooperative nest emergence behaviors. And this is looking at um, how their social behavior can help provide that flexibility to their life history transition, this large transition from the eggshell up in the nest cavity, um, up to the surface um, after they hatch. And so my study system is the snapping turtle. And so the reason I've worked with the snapping turtle is because we know they vocalize. And I have worked on their vocalizations and have characterized their vocalizations, but we still don't have a great understanding why they vocalize. And one idea is that these vocalizations are essential for uh, nest emergence and that the vocalizations can provide a social cue that indicates to clutch mates the overlying or the overlying ecological conditions like precipitation, time of day, um, or even temperature. Um, and so another reason the vocalizations are really helpful is that because it can help us when we know what to look out for, what vocalizations to look for, we can help that or use that in our subsequent analyses. And so my data collection took place over two uh, summers. This was in 2021 and 2022. And this was at the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station, just up in Algonquin Park. And so over the two summers, I collected about 30 snapping turtle nests. And then I incubated them in the wild in in an uh, in situ experiment. And so I had these experimental plots where each turtle nest was paired up with, they had each a recorder, a microphone, they had a temperature logger, and they had a camera trap to monitor above ground emergence. And this was repeated um, over the two summers. And so the goal was overall to estimate the strength and relationship between ecological factors and social factors and how this uh, interchangeably or uh, interacts and affects acoustic communication and nest emergence behaviors. And so one hypothesis we're testing is if vocalizations function in nest emergence, maybe this uh, maybe we might see an intermediate uh, factor where ecological factors cue vocalization behavior, which then subsequently cues digging behavior, where vocalizations act as a behavioral mediator, uh, behavioral mediator, um, or an intermediate factor. Alternatively, if it, if it vocalizations aren't facilitating this ecological cue, we might see a more direct effect from ecological factors um, to digging digging behaviors where there is no intermediate factor um, or vocalization cue. And so to do this, I used a um, clustering algorithm using Kaleidoscope Pro. And so this sound analysis software um, is super helpful for extracting vocalizations in the nest and movement in the nest. And so I used this program. Um, I trained a model to identify vocalizations and movement throughout all um, hours of recording. And so it was a lot of hours of data. And so if I manually did that, it would take a really long time. And so I trained um, a clustering algorithm to extract vocalizations and then subsequently label each vocalization. And because this is a machine learning based process, I did validate it against an independent data set. And so the model was approximately 82% accurate um, it was accurate about 82% of the time. And so to account for that accuracy, I simulated the data set a thousand times. And then from those simulated data set, quantified vocalizations and movement per hour. I then took that data and looked and uh, tested three candidate models. The first model looked at time and precipitation and its effect on temperature. 
The second one looked at time, temperature, precipitation, um, and its effect on vocalizations. And the third one looked at time, temperature, precipitation, um, and vocalizations on movement in the nest. And so taking these three candidate models, I put them into a structural equation modeling framework. And these were all guided based on predetermined hypotheses um, and put in this framework. And so using the three candidate models, I was able to test the interrelationship between the factors. And so if going back to the hypotheses, if ecological factors directly cue emergence, you might see a stronger relationship from temperature to movement. If vocalizations are that mediator, they're the intermediate factor, then you might see a stronger support for this um, indirect pathway where temperature affects vocalizations and vocalizations affect movement. And so overall, this was the best fit model from the original hypothesis framework. I removed pathways uh, from clutch size and its effect on vocalizations and movement, precipitation and its effect on temperature and movement. Um, and then we got these values. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm going to focus on a few key results that we pulled out from this. The numbers are the standardized um, effect, the standardized uh, effect for the equa uh, equation model, and the numbers in uh, brackets are the number of times the pathway was supported out of the 1,000 simulations. And so out of 1,000 um, data sets, 966 of them were um, sig significantly or supported uh, by the model, where three of them had convergence issues, so we removed them. And so the first result showed that time of day had a strong direct effect on movement, where when we look at time of day and movement per hour, um, when we hold vocalizations and temperature constant, we see that there's a peak in movement in the evening around um, 6 p.m., which shows that these turtles are able to respond or sense the overlying um, circadian cycle um, and conditions. We also saw that there was a strong direct negative effect on movement. And so we saw stronger support for this pathway here. And so when we looked at temperature, we saw that turtles prefer to move at cooler temperatures at around uh, 10 to 15 minute or around 10 to 15 degrees. And then the third result was we found a very strong relationship between vocalizations and movement where you had a positive correlation and we saw more vocalize we saw more movement when there was more vocalizations. And this brings up questions. We see that there's a strong effect uh, from ecological factors to movement. And we also see this effect from vocalizations um, to movement. And so even though um, we see this relationship, we can probably, we kind of go to this question of, is it vocalizations that are facilitating nest emergence synchrony? And from the SEM results, we could probably conclude that they do play a part. But we, we still don't know is whether the turtles are emerging at the same time. And it's really hard to look at nest emergence um, in the field because you're not always present in the field. And so one th tool that helps us with that is camera traps. And so just quickly looking at the camera trap footage that I recorded, I went to look at when the turtles were leaving, we know vocalizations is correlated, we know temperature is correlated, but what are they doing when they exit the nest? And so here's just a video of some of the camera trap files of them coming out. And what we found was that within 24 hours, around 85% of the hatchlings had emerged within the nest. And so this was pretty synchronous. And when we look from the turtles that left within 24 hours, 24 hours is a large time span, we see that they were minutes apart from each other, where these box plots here show that they're skewed towards zero. And these turtles are coming out within a short time span between those events. And so overall, yeah, uh, overall, we found that these turtles are synchronizing and time of day and temperature do affect movement. And so it's very possible that vocalizations affect this movement, but that there's a uh, measured uh, ecological factors that we didn't account for in our model. And that might be explaining the variation. Um, and I'd like thank you to thank everyone who's helped me. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Have you guys done any playback 
experiments and see if you can kind of trigger? Yeah, so I've done playback experiments for hatching. And so we found that the playback for hatching didn't really have an effect. I haven't done any playback experiment for in terms of uh, emergence. So in terms of hatching, didn't see really an effect. But yeah, that's a great idea. Playbacks are definitely the way to go move forward with that. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, uh, not being in the turtle literature, has the sea turtle people or even terrestrial people shown whether synchronized emergence would be adaptive in terms of reducing predation? Um, like do skunks yeah. cue into that and get the whole litter or is it actually uh, more of a satiation thing and they escape? Yeah. So in sea turtles, we have a really good record of their emergence. They all come out at once. All the nests come out. Um, I'm going to try to make it. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, but yeah, in sea turtles, it's definitely a predation factor. In freshwater turtles, especially in snapping turtles, we don't actually know if it's a predator adaptation. It could be predators. It could be energetics. They reduce their energy. Um, but it, it's really hard to tell. It's probably not a swamping effect because they didn't come out within seconds of each other. They came out within a few minutes. So it could be a predator effect, um, but definitely it's a little bit too spread out for it to be a swamping effect. And there's not enough of them to swamp the predators, at least in freshwater systems. Yeah. Okay. Hello. My name is Caitlin Menzies, and I'm a master's student with uh, Christina Davey and Rosalind Dakin. And I'm going to tell you about lunch clubs and dinner dates, how we used feeding aggregations to explore freshwater turtle sociality. So sociality refers to the tendency for animals to live and group together. And this is fairly common across nature with sort of the most simple form of it being two animals sharing the same space at the same time with much more complex things on the other side of the spectrum like use sociality in animal societies. And although reptiles, especially non avian reptiles, might not be what a lot of people think of when they think of social animals, I'm assuming it's a little bit different for this crowd. We sort of already know that they are social. And there's been lots of fantastic studies done by people probably in this room and at this conference that show that, including um, communal nesting, parental care, um, group basking, vocalizations like Claudia just talked about, and large group gatherings. And next, I'm going to talk to you about feeding aggregations. So feeding aggregations are also very common in nature. And the benefit of joining a feeding aggregation seems to be a decrease in predation, an increase in reproductive success, and an increase in foraging success. But like anything in nature, there's also some downsides to joining a feeding aggregation, such as if you're in this big group, you're much more visible to predators. There's also the chance for competition to re, um, reduce resources and just have general more stress by having to compete with other individuals. And in some reptiles, particularly a lot of bird species, they can cut down on these stresses by joining mixed feeding or mixed species feeding aggregations, which allows for there to be different niches within that feeding aggregation and less competitive stress. So what we wanted to look at was, is there a social aspect to freshwater turtle feeding aggregations? And if there was, what factors influence those freshwater turtle feeding aggregations and their structure? So we did this by using data collected by the Wetlands and Reptiles Project from 2009 to 2019 and in 2022. Once again, shout out to anyone in this auditorium that may have collected that data. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. It's a lot of data. Um, I had 995 observations and 823 individual turtles. And it's important to note that we used hoop traps that were baited with sardines. And that's what created this perceived food source and feeding aggregations around it. Um, so the first question is, is there a social aspect to freshwater turtle feeding aggregations? And to look at this, we looked at the index of dispersion, which measure, measures the pattern of distribution of animals or how clumpy or aggregated they are in a landscape. And this ranges from uniform to random to aggregated. And aggregated or clumped distributions are indices of over one. And in our population that we studied, the index of dispersion was 1.5. So we saw that there was an aggregated distribution, which means, yes, there does seem to be a social aspect to these turtle feeding aggregations. And then we wanted to take a step forward and say, okay, so if they are social, what is influencing their structure and how are these groupings structured in general? 
So to do that, the first thing we looked at was, does species affect these groupings? And to do that, we created social networks. So to create a social network, we found two turtles in a trap together. We'd give them an association that would look like this. And then on another day, we might find those same turtles in different traps with different individuals. And now we add another, connect, or another association to our social network. So green turtle two now has an association with a turtle of a different species, which is just pink turtle for now. And then over time, these kind of build out into something that could look like this example here. They are more complex than this in reality, but for the purposes of letting everyone be on the same page with social networks, we're gonna run with this one. So from social networks, you can get an assortativity value. And assortativity refers to the tendency for individuals within a network to be associated with um, other individuals with similar or different traits. So when we're looking at species, a positive species assortment would be the tendency to associate with the same species, and it would be a positive number up to positive one. And on the other hand, a negative species assortment is the tendency to associate with a different species and could go all the way down to negative one. So in our example here, green turtle two would show a more negative species assortment and green turtle one would show a more positive species assortment. In the community we looked at, this was what the actual social network looked like. So in this network, we have individuals as the circles with the black lines connecting them to show an association. The Blanding's turtles are in yellow, Painted turtles are in pink, Snapping turtles are in green, and Spotted turtles are in orange. You can't quite see the orange ones super well because there was only around four in this entire study and they are very small um, because those sizes um, show how many associations that individual has. If the circle is bigger, it has more associations. So we can see kind of some painted turtles there with a lot more associations than some of the others. And so we looked at species assortativity with this and we found a um, species assortativity of 0 0.49. So if we remember from the last slide, that means that it's a positive species assortativity and they are often found with their own species. And the next thing we looked at that might um, be an influencing factor of these feeding aggregations was the sex of the turtle. And to do this, I made individual networks for each of the species so that I could look at this within species. And I will note there's no spotted turtles on this one because they actually were never associated with each other. So I could not run this, um, like run this uh, analysis with them. And in the same vein, a positive sex assortment would be the tendency to associate with the same sex, and a negative sex assortment would be the tendency to associate with the opposite sex. So in all of the species I looked at, there was a very slight but non-significant um, negative species assortment. So it means it was slightly more often or more common to find these turtles with the opposite sex. But the non-significance of it surprised me because we measured these turtles or had these hoop traps out during May, which is one of turtles peak mating seasons. So I thought, oh, this would be a great time to go get some mating opportunities. But that does not seem to be the case with these turtles. So we do know though that the turtles do mate occasionally in there because we have pulled traps and seen turtles mating in the traps. So it does happen, but it doesn't seem to be a big influencing or draw for the turtles to go to a feeding aggregation to mate. Um, the next thing we looked at that might influence these groupings was body size. Um, so to do this, I looked at the curved carapace length as a measure of body size and the number of associations that a turtle had. And I looked at this also with um, linear mix models. Um, that's one of the models, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so these turtles um, were also in mixed species feeding aggregations, like I mentioned earlier, which meant it wasn't all the same species. And anyone who knows turtles in Ontario knows that the size of these turtles can vary a lot based on species. For example, painted turtles are generally smaller than a snapping turtle would be as an adult. Um, so I also put some models out there to account for species as a predictor, size as a predictor, and then both as a predictor. And in this case, species was the best predictor alone. Size was not a good predictor for the number of associations an individual turtle would have. Um, I do want to note that there's been previous work that shows in painted turtles and in a basking situation that larger individuals tended to have fewer associations. 
but this did not seem to be the case in feeding aggregations. Um, and as well, painted turtles were the most social in terms of painted turtle individuals tended to have the most associations in general. So that's also kind of cool. And the last thing I looked at was repeated dyads to look at sort of repeated bonds between individual turtles. I often refer to this as turtle friends, but some people don't like all that talk. They like a more scientific, so also repeated dyads being turtles that are caught in the same trap on multiple occasions. And this only happened four times in the over 10 years that I looked at this. And it was, once again, non-significant and relatively low when compared to randomized models looking at the same thing. Um, and just for sort of a fun fact, the only turtles found in repeated dyads was a single Blandings turtle and three painted turtles. So to wrap up, um, we found that there is a social aspect to the freshwater turtle aggregations we investigated, and that these feeding aggregations were mainly influenced by species, with painted turtles being the most social of the species in our community. And now I want to just briefly touch on why people in this room and people outside of this room should care about studies like this, um, other than the fact that I know everyone here loves turtles and we love to hear about them. Um, but the first is that non-avian reptile sociality is still underrepresented in the literature, especially when compared to birds and mammals. And like I said, there is some lovely people here at this conference that are adding to that literature. So great, keep that up. And I hope that um, we can also as a community build on the research I've done here and look more into turtle sociality. As well, the use of behavior and conservation literature is also, I think, being underutilized. Um, when understanding species social behavior can be important in a lot of different conservation things, such as Head Start programs, um, translocating individuals like was talked about with the snakes, and also in how would something like a road split a population and how would that affect their social dynamics. Um, and I just want to wrap up quickly by once again thanking anyone here who collected data and acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And the research I did was on the traditional territories of the Adirondack and Mississauga people. And thank you again for watching. So I've got a question from online. So I'm okay. going to start there. Yeah. Cheryl asks, was the food source Oh, of course, my chat scrolls. Excuse <laughs> me. Was the food for source uniformly distributed um, or was that a driver of aggregation? So one of the OK, I'm going to see if I I hope I understand what that's asking. I think it's asking um, about whether these. I guess the answer is yes. The point of this was to create feeding aggregations by giving them a food source. Um, I'm not sure if there's more to that question than that, but um, yes, we did create artificial feeding aggregations by baiting these traps with sardines so that the turtles would all come there to feed specifically. Um, if there's more to that question, feel free to email me. My email's on there if I didn't get that, understand that properly. <laughs> Um, is there any literature on if relatedness is a factor in aggregation? Like, are they hanging out with their families? Um, yeah, there is some literature on that. Um, I didn't look at that because mainly we didn't have that information, which is the only reason I didn't look at that. I would love to look at that. Um, and I'm drawing a blank right now on what the literature says, but I know it is out there and um, you can find it. I unfortunately don't. I feel confident in my knowledge to say what that answer is right now, but um, we just didn't study that because we didn't have that genetic information to link any of these individuals in that way. And that is something that I think would be super cool to add to a study like this. Um, so just to ensure I understand what you were saying correctly, mm -hmm. uh, this a giant snapping turtle in a hoop trap did not affect whether there was sociality or not? So this is another thing that is kind of a weird, potentially confounding thing in this study. Um, we saw that they were generally grouped with their own species, but we have no way of knowing who entered the trap first and who followed, which, I mean, there's been talk about potentially putting cameras on it because I would predict that if there was a bunch of big snappers in there, a painted turtle wouldn't necessarily want to be in there. And we sort of did see that 
but we also have no way of knowing if the painted turtle went in first and then unwittingly got stuck with a bunch of snappers <laughs> it didn't want to be with because it couldn't then leave the trap till we checked it. So that is something that it would be really cool to know who's entering at what time. Um, but in general, the groupings that we did end up seeing tended to lean towards being with their own species. Okay. Um, uh, okay. First, a heads up, this is going to be a data-free talk. It's mainly to pique your curiosity and uh, potentially attract collaborators. Um, so the Liard Hot Springs is in the very north of BC, right on the border of Yukon. We were there in 2021 in April to do something totally unrelated, which is to look for these endangered hot water phyza, which is a tiny snail, um, with one of the co-authors on the stock, Jennifer Heron. But I got slightly distracted by these guys. Um, for those of you who don't know, Western toad is widely distributed from Mexico to Alaska. Lots of cool things about it, but let's get down to the nitty gritty, which is breeding. They usually start breeding when the snow's off the ground and air temperatures are around five degrees. And they're what's called explosive breeders, which means that all the eligible adults kind of congregate all at the same time. And business is conducted slam bam in about a week to 10 days, and then they migrate back to their foraging. Um, and so the key things to keep in mind are explosive breeders and about five degrees is what they, they like. And so we arrive at Liard Hot Springs. There's snow that can sink you right up to your hips, mostly about two to three degrees of snow on the ground. Um, air temperatures barely got about zero, but the hot springs, which is the key here, um, comes bubbling out of the earth like at 56 degrees centigrade, goes through a couple of pools where the humans hang out, and then spreads out into this big wetland where the water temperatures are balmy 15 to 38 degrees centigrade. And what do we find when we go there, ostensibly looking for snails, is toads in every stage of their life cycle. There's amplexus, there's eggs, there's like three size classes of tadpoles, there's metamorphs, and some skinny metamorphs going, uh-oh, came out at the wrong time. Um, and the temperature, as I already told you, so the thermal complex at Liard Hot Springs is one alpha, but then there's multiple places. And this is going on at every thermal spring around in the park, except for the one that the US guys dug up into a deep pool. It's happening everywhere else. Um, and does this happen anywhere else in BC? And sure enough, there's a record um, from Atlan Warm Springs, which is like 700 kilometers to the west. At Atlan Hot Springs, the other co-author on the talk had recorded that they'd been there for a couple of decades up till about 2005. And then they have disappeared from the Warm Springs, but I, I'm going to call them the spa toads have disappeared but the common or plebeian toads are still breeding all around. So there's lots of toads around, but the spa toads have disappeared. Um, oh, I'm just, just to show you where the hot springs and Adlin hot springs are. Um, and Brian noticed that the toads actually get to these hot springs in late February, March, where the temperature does not even get above zero. Like what the hell's going on? Um, so first we have to ask, is there any advantage to showing up in the spa other than, ooh, it's cool. Um, and yes, time to metamorphosis has been shown to be really important in multiple amphibians and closely related to time to metamorphosis is size at metamorphosis and especially time, size at first overwintering because these toads are coming out in you know May at the start of the active season, they have lots of time to feed and grow, so huge fitness benefits. And so it's great that they have fitness benefits, okay. Um, but how the hell does this evolve, right? Like, um, is it genetic? Is it plastic? Even if it's plastic behavior, the spot toads become genetically isolated from the plebeian toads because they come out in February, March. It's usually a one-way street, they die. The other guys come out in May. There's this genetic divergence that can happen. 
And then how do they know to come out in the middle of overwintering? Like, what's the cue? Like, how do they get there? All kinds of questions. And then if toads are doing this, are other amphibians doing it? And so this is the collaboration part. Look at the beautiful natural sites. We have all the orange dots are hot springs in Western Canada, huge diversity of hot springs available for study. There's even one called Toad River with its own Toad River hot springs, which we don't know if the toads are there breeding. So this is just a request to see if there are people interested, need skills way beyond me, like genomics and riding a snowmobile. Um, and thanks um, for listening. All right. So uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa Reynolds, and I am from the Lougheed Lab at Queen's University. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about an ongoing project we have at, at our lab, uh, talking about the impacts of climate change on the breeding phenology of temperate interns. So as we all know, climate change is irreversibly altering ecosystems. Uh, this is leading to shifts in species distributions, increasing frequencies of natural hazards, such as flooding and drought, as well as increasing the spread of pathogens. Uh, about 41% of amphibians are considered threatened at this point, and a lot of the factors leading to this uh, threatened amount of uh, amphibians is due is thought to be due to climate change. Uh, so temperature is an important trigger if, for energy intensive behaviors in amphibian species, and phenological shifts in emergence and breeding are one of many possible outcomes of shifting climate. So in most spring calling and urn species in northern temperate regions, males begin calling uh, shortly after emergence in the breeding season to establish territories and to find mates. So calling is therefore can be can therefore be used as a proxy to estimate the initiation of the breeding season. In 2013, Klaus and Lougheed uh, did this fantastic study on historic records of emergence and breeding in unurns in Ontario. And they found that a lot of the species are actually shifting their calls earlier in warmer winters. So they found uh, these three, three species over here, uh, American toad, northern leopard frog, and wood frog, uh, emerged significantly earlier in years with warmer winters. And first state of calling was negatively correlated with minimum temperatures in seven other Ontario species. So we aim to further characterize these shifts in call phenology uh, under warming winter and spring conditions. So we are focused on learning if call phenologies are shifting and if the shifts differ between species population and habitat. So for 15 years, uh, we've been setting out these, tem uh, these temperature loggers and acoustic recorders at 29 different sites all across Eastern Ontario. It's important to note that some of these sites were not maintained for the full uh, 15 years, but three of them have been continuously studied uh, in terms of acoustic recordings and temperature logging. So we used passive automatic recording, so entirely hands off other than to change batteries all the time. Uh, so what we used was uh, the wildlife acoustic song meters. They were set to record for one hour and 15 minutes after sunset for one hour. And this was done every single day from early March to September. So again, 15 years, 29 sites, we have a whole lot of acoustic recordings. So acoustic recordings are great because we can differentiate species uh, very easily due to their calls. Each species in Ontario has a very distinct call, so we'll be able to identify which species occur at each mark, uh, at each site. So my goal for this project is to try and figure out, you know, what's happening with the phenologies at each of these locations. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, training Kaleidoscope Pro, which we've gotten a little bit of a uh, introduction here at this conference today. On. So I will be training Kaleidoscope Pro to identify 10 different inerrant species that occur at these sites. And I will likewise try to modify the amphibian calling index to work with the Kaleidoscope Pro data that I will be acquiring. So Kaleidoscope Pro basically can output an Excel spreadsheet. It has a lot of nice lists of when calling occurs for each species that I will train it on. And all of these numbers I can compile to try and estimate how many individuals are calling at the same time. Not really a measure of population by any means, but just sort of an indication of how many of these frogs are calling. Uh, so as I mentioned, we also are monitoring the microclimates of some of these sites. So these are a couple of the sites uh, at different months that we've been examining. 
Uh, so the three sites that have been monitored continuously, those are some of the three sites that we have put out these temperature loggers. So they measure uh, air temperature and humidity levels, as well as uh, we are recording soil and water temperature. So this is just to hope to understand the microclimates at these sites so we can better estimate kind of what impacts climate change is having on these sites and if these shifts uh, in temperatures are correlating with shifts in uh, the inurin vocalizations that we're noticing. So basically what we hope to learn is, again, are the phenology shifting? Do these shifts vary with uh, temperature? Are they varying with species? Are they different between populations, different sites? Uh, because we're examining a huge transect of eastern Ontario, uh, we're looking at just a massive area with a bunch of different habitats and a bunch of different species present. So we're just hoping to better characterize these shifts if there are any present and uh, yeah, see if they correlate to any environmental factors that are shifting with climate change. So I would just like to thank all the people in the Lahid lab who have uh, made this data set possible. And yeah, thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about my master's research, which I'm focusing on some turtles that are currently at risk of being in an area that is going to be destroyed by some developments at Magnetowan First Nation. So located in, in Ontario on the eastern Georgian Bay is Magnetowan First Nation. It's um, a part of the territory described in the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. And it's also highlighted as a UNESCO biosphere, which highlights its ecological global significance. Um, and the lands of Magnetowan First Nation were recently bisected by a transmission line. You can see that here highlighted in pink on the right. And they're currently threatened by pending highway expansion, which you can see highlighted in white. It's not yet come through, but it's planned to come through. And this will further destroy and fragment the landscapes here. And so long-term monitoring at Magnetowan First Station has already revealed that there are lots of species at risk reptiles living here. And the further development of habitats here can exacerbate their declines that they're already facing due to road mortality in this area. So after working with Magnetowan First Nation for over two years, um, they've invited me to collaborate with them doing some research to help better understand um, these reptiles in this area. And the collective goal of our research is to ensure reciprocity, respect, and responsibility through every step. Uh, and to address the socio-political landscape of this research, we will be creating research protocols such as data sovereignty agreements, and we'll use the principles of OCAP, which highlight ownership, control, access, and possession of the data when creating these. While discussing research priorities with Magnetron First Nation, they highlighted specific interest in understanding the turtle communities that will be affected by the impending highway and the already developed transmission line. So we use these to guide our research objectives, which are to develop a baseline understanding of turtle communities within the proposed highway expansion by using both um, occupancy and detectability models as well as investigate the relationship between turtle occupancy and environmental variables by using occupancy modeling. So to examine how developments will affect the turtle communities, we sampled a subsect of wetlands that we sampled based on heat maps that we used. So the heat maps are created using 10 years of road survey data, um, and it highlights point density of turtle observations along the current highway. And using that, we then selected eight priority wetlands that are most um, at risk, like the highest density of turtle populations are near those. And on the right, you can see what the current landscape looks like. So on the left, you see the current highway. In the middle is where the planned highway expansion will be. And then on the right is the transmission line, which you can see expands into <laughs> forever. <laughs> um, and in order to sample these turtles and find them, we did both walking surveys this summer for about 80 survey hours, as well as trapping surveys for 50 days, which works out to about 1,200 hours. And we got really lucky. We found a lot of turtles, 126 new in this area, which isn't so lucky for the turtles if the highway ended up coming through. And uh, most of these were painted turtles, but we also found blendings and snapping turtles. And then our goal is to use a software program called presence to estimate the conditional occupancy as well as the detectability of turtles in these wetlands. And then in addition, at each wetland, we measured a set of environmental variables uh, that have been expected to impact turtle occupancy based on previous research. 
And some of these include wetland surface area, the amount of forest surrounding the habitats, and the distance to the road. And I will use AICs in the future to conduct model selections and determine which environmental variables are most likely to impact turtle occupancy and the wetlands. So why does this matter? Well, creating occupancy tools, occupancy prediction and modeling tools will provide site-specific data to Magnetowan First Nation, which can then inform their decision-making in regards to the conservation actions they will take when these developments come through, protecting these species at risk turtles, and then better understanding the variables that affect occupancy in the wetlands can help them then further identify other wetlands of significance to them. And although Magnetwan First Nation has access to some environmental assessment data, they asked us to do this research to bolster their understanding of what their habitats look like so that they can really make the best decision and put their best foot forward when these highway developments come through. And although our research focuses on turtles, obviously protecting turtles requires protecting their habitats, so it'll lead to broader ecosystem protection in this area. And overall, we hope to highlight the ecological and cultural significance of these lands and help protect them in the future. Thank you for listening. <laughs>